Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Continue in our series entitled Home for Christmas. How many guys going home for Christmas, traveling home, or people coming to you, to your house? Anybody? Man, you guys are homeboys, homebodies. <laughs> Several of them. Well, I heard about this family who had been married, this couple had been married over 50 years. And they were together and they wanted, they had a couple of kids in in other states and they wanted their kids to come home for Christmas. So mom calls the sister or the daughter and says, sweetie, he goes, can y'all come home for Christmas? And of course she's like, no, mom, he goes, we can't do that. He goes, it's inflation, things are rough and it's a difficult time right now. He goes, so we're not going to be able to come home. Me and brother, you're just going to hang out here. It's like, all right. So dad calls, dad calls the son, he goes, son, he goes, hey, listen, I got some really, really bad news. He goes, what's going on, dad? He says, man, me and your mom have been together for 50 years, and I just can't take it anymore. We're getting a divorce before Christmas. He's like, wait a minute, what? He goes, tell your sister, please. He hangs up the phone. He tells his sister. Sister calls. He goes, dad, brother, just tell me what's happening here. He goes, I, do me a favor. Don't do anything. Don't do anything before Christmas. We're going to be flying home. We'll be home for Christmas this year. (laughs) He goes, okay. Hangs up the phone. Sweetheart, the kids are coming home for Christmas. (laughs) Greater news. They're paying paying their own way. (laughs) I had to share that with you this morning. Uh, Hit your QR code there in front of you. And um, that's where you can probably get our notes and some of the things that are going on in the life of the church. Before I get into this morning's message real quick, i got a couple of things to share with you. First of all, uh, the admin, some of you guys were asking about the admin building. It's still in play. We're just waiting for permits. I think we've been waiting for five weeks now or plus. So, um, but all we need is that the septic tank to take place, a little bit of plumbing. Uh, we're going to paint it and then put the decking out in front. And so we appreciate you guys just serving in that area. Also, the trip to Guatemala, you guys made provision for them. They're over there right now serving. Um, but the rest of the, the Christmas offering from here moving forward to the end of the year, that's going to go towards, I don't know if you guys know this, but once we move to the admin building, we're shifting. We're actually creating a space in this back area for special needs kids. And so they're, they're going to be converting all that. And so the remainder of the Christmas offering will go towards that uh, when we're ready to make that transition and move. So we appreciate you guys doing that as well. Last thing is the 24th, Christmas Eve, we got three services that we're going to be going to, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 11 o'clock, okay? So you guys who are still coming to the 9, just stay here. But you can let people know if you wake up late, just come to the 10. And uh, if not, just come to the 11. If not, just come next week, all right? And then at the, um, anyways, but those, those are a couple of things that I just wanted to share uh, with you. This morning, what I want to do is this whole series was, was kind of like, okay, Lord, I just, I saw all the hustle and bustle and I was like, man, let's just simplify Christmas this year. No production, no, um, you know, stage drama and all this kind of stuff, which is all great. But I just felt like people were tired and it was been a long year been a good year, but it's been a long year. And so let's just simplify it. And I wanted to get all the pastors to come up and ask, uh, I asked them, I said, what did Jesus like, Jesus like, what did Jesus look like to you as you were growing up? And, uh, you know, what lessons did you learn? What what are some of the things that you gleaned from? So Pastor Joel did a fantastic, I get, listen, I was, I think it's one of the best crafted messages last week. You want to download that because it was just a fantastic message. What's that? Well, this one's going to be more amazing. <laughs> you just wait. <clears throat> it was amazing, seriously. I mean, I was like, man, Joel, that's just a great message. And so uh, Pastor Jeremiah is coming on next week, and he's going to share a little bit about his Montana experience or wherever he was at. And then Pastor Natalie and I will be doing the Christmas uh, Eve service, 9, 10, and 11. I'm actually going to ask Pastor Joel and Emily possibly to help us and join us along. They're just finding out right now. <laughs> um, but what did Jesus look like growing up in my home? You guys have heard me. I've been here 17 years with you guys. So y'all heard what happened in the Avalos home so many times. But I'll just share it because we've got a bunch of new ones, folks. And so at, at Christmas at our house, at Dad's house on 969 East Wynard Street, which, by the way, pray for him because he's not feeling well. But um, we used to go down to his, his house, mom's house, all the time. And mom was, loved cooking. 
She'd make tamales. She'd make menudo. She'd do all the stuff. All the cousins, well, all the family primarily would go down there and, you know, just kind of spend time together. And dad had this tradition, because he grew up like this, that we wouldn't open up gifts until midnight. And so we'd have to wait. Us kids were like, man, it's, it's, so, you know, it's so long. We'd go to Mass at either 6 o'clock, or we'd go to midnight Mass. And then we couldn't open gifts until after Mass. I'm like, man, what the heck? It's 1245. So it was, it was difficult. It was challenging. <laughs> but that's kind of what the tradition was. But more than anything, if there was one thing that I could take away uh, from our experience growing up was the one word, family. Family. Can you say that with me? Family. Family is important during this time of the year. Family is important every time of the year. And you're like, not in my house. It's not. And I know some folks have uh, difficulty with their household and their, their whole experience. And there's different dynamics in different homes. But in our house, dad made an emphasis that we are going to be together as a family. He grew up that same way. I asked dad, I said, dad, what was it like you growing up? This week I had asked him because I, I had forgotten but he tell me so. He goes, son, he goes, we didn't have any, any money. We would have little bitty gifts here and there. Dad would have me go. My grandpa would have him go and look for a tree and cut it. I says, well, where'd you go? He goes, just around the neighborhood. I just find a tree and cut it. <laughs> it's like, it's hilarious. <laughs> He'd bring it and I said, and they'd wrap some lights around there. And that was their Christmas tree. And uh, it was just real cool. But he goes, but the one thing we always did was we always had family coming over and we would feed them and what have you. And so that was uh, 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 our experience as well. And I, I appreciate that so much. The value of family is very, very important to me. That's one of the reasons why when you walk into this church, uh, a lot of people, a lot of the common comments that are made is like, man, this feels like home. This feels like family here. I think it's just a, an expression of what we experience in our lives and what we try to live out in our lives. And so, you know, you can't pick, you can't choose your family, right? It's God's gift to you, whether you realize it or not. Uh, family is a lot like fudge. It's mostly sweet, but every now and then you got some nuts in there. Yeah. Isn't that the truth, right? So when we came to Christ, 1984, all the way till 1990, we still did this same routine. We did candlelight services. We go to mom's house. I invited all the church over there. We'd go and celebrate and do all that stuff. And so it was routine. It was traditional. It was a ritual for us up until 1990. Uh, 1990, Natalie and I uh, were called to go to Bible school in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And so we were down there by ourselves. There was no biological family that first year. We, uh, the Lord spoke to us and told us to go down there. Well, Kim, where are you going? <laughs> She's heard this like 15 times. And so, um, so we wound up going over there. You know, my three daughters, little kids, elementary and younger, my dog, lady, dog, she was like a prostitute dog. She had six more dogs when we got there. <laughs> and we were all by ourselves. Then that Christmas comes along. We go to Bible school, and that Christmas comes along, and we realize, like, man, this is going to be a very difficult year. Mom and dad, no tradition, no tamales, no food, no, you know, lights, no festivities, no menudo, none of those things. None of the family's going to come. And so I'm feeling kind of you know, just lonely, and I'm feeling like actually not a good provider because we didn't have money to, for the kids. I mean, we literally were in, 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 the, in, on, in the table in the living room. We would split up our Snickers bar, which was our dessert, in three and give the girls each a piece. That particular Christmas, um, even though we were so thankful that God had made provision for us, uh, I realized that that was going to be a difficult Christmas for my wife and the kids. And so we found ourselves there with no biological family. And then God did something. He began to expand my view of what family actually is. So we are sitting there in the living room, I mean in the kitchen, with our last meal. It's not like we were dying, it's like our last meal, but there's literally nothing in the cupboards. Like we had, we had eaten everything. And we're with our girls sitting there, and we are using our last eggs and, and milk and whatever it is that we had, and that would be our last meal. And we let the girls eat, and Natalie and I were sitting there uh, just thinking, thanking God and just, you know, asking them for provision and what have you. And then all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. I'm like, oh, man, who's this? General! General, there's a guy named Willie, six foot nine, was, you know, ex-basketball player, 
And he goes, he called Natalie the general. Anybody, anybody knows why? <laughs> and he say, sweet A. That was me, sweet A. He goes, open the door. I got, I got God's blessings on you. I was like, what are you talking about, Willie? He's just a great guy. See, Willie worked at, uh, he was in Bible school too, but he worked at a local Baptist church downtown. And he was a janitor there, custodian there. And that particular morning, his pastor had asked him to go and clean out all the cupboards in the kitchen in, his, in their pantry that they use for benevolence and outreach. So he took all of the food, all of the boxes, he boxed them all up and put it in his car. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him. He goes, the general, that's the general's, that's the Avalos' home. Take that to them. Little did he know that we were sitting there on that table with our last meal, like wondering how we're going to get groceries for the remainder of this month. And he comes in, he goes, I got a blessing for you. So he goes, leave the door open. So he goes and gets to the car. He starts coming in and bringing all this. He literally filled all of our pantries and it was overflowing. We were just weeping (laughs) because God was so faithful. It's like, who is this guy? This guy don't know us. All of a sudden, my heart began to expand uh, what true family is about according to the scriptures. And we sat down with him and we just thanked God for him, prayed for him and stuff. And he went on his way and we were just excited about at least we have meals for the rest of the month. And if that wasn't enough, that I go down to get the mail and um, there was an envelope in there from some family. I didn't even know who they were. I opened it up. I was like, who is this family? And uh, there was a check in there for $400 for the Avalos family for Merry Christmas from the Meckles. Jeff Meckle, who I didn't, I never even met Jeff Meckle. I just, he happened to be in the service. When we left our church, he was in that last service that I left when people prayed for us and we took off to Oklahoma. But the Spirit of God put uh, us on his heart. He writes a check out and we wound up not only getting all this food, but now we wound up with $400 to make provision or get little gifts for our kids. Isn't that crazy? Again, my heart began to expand. It's like, this is your family. And then to top that off, that wasn't enough. Natalie gets a phone call from her dad. They'd been estranged for years just because of situations, family stuff. Joe is on his way to Oklahoma, to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. He goes, what are you coming? He goes, I got a bunch of gifts for the kids. I just want to, I want to give it to them. He goes, well, just send them. He goes, no, I'm driving over there. He drove all the way to Oklahoma, sat down with us, and gave us all these gifts, gave me some cash. I was like, I'll never forget that man and respect that man the rest of my life. There's something that happens when God uses uses people that are not your biological family and treat you as if though you were one of their own. Something breaks inside, right? And man, that particular year, that's exactly what God was doing. He was changing how I view, he was transforming how I view family. And he did it through an awareness, just like I became more aware. It's like, this is what he means. This is who my true family is. The people sitting right next to you, you see that guy right there constantly talking? He's your family. (laughs) Here's another one right here. (laughs) This is our family. They're not biological, but they're blood family. God specifically chose individuals to enter into your life in this season of your life to make his love known towards those who are lonely and broken and weary and hurting or struggling. That's what God does. And so my framework for family all of a sudden enlarged forever. And here's what I know about all of you. Your framework for family needs to be enlarged as well. It was through that awareness that all of a sudden transformation took place in my life. There's a quote that I uh, read this week. It says, the basic for any approach of self uh, transformation is an ever increasing awareness of reality and the shedding of illusions. All of a sudden, in that experience, I became more aware of who God wanted, um, who God allowed to be a part of my family. And the illusions that I had before began to just shrink and dissipate. My heart enlarged, my whole world expanded. 
Actually, Pastor Joel said something similar several weeks ago about faith. Faith is an ever-increasing awareness of reality that leads to transformation. Joel Mall. Seriously. When he quoted that, some of you guys didn't like that definition of faith. But I'm realizing that, you know what? That's probably a very good definition of faith. Amen. Your heart begins to expand. So my question this morning is, that what about family? What does the scripture say about family? Thank you for asking. <laughs> this is the scripture that popped in my heart all week long, and I didn't know how he was going to use this and what direction, but Psalm 68 says this, Marcus, I set the solitary in a family. The solitary just means the lonely, the broken, the weak, the wounded, the bruised, the worn out, those that are struggling, whatever, however you want to put them. Now, some of you guys feel that, that right now. But God makes provision abound towards them in those moments by allowing them to be a part of a family. And a family that's not necessarily their biological Right? It's beautiful. Let me give you the backdrop of this Psalm 68. God had just led the children of Israel, you know, out of slavery from the Pharaoh's hand, right? And then he brings them into the promised land. When they're in the promised land, they actually had to fight to occupy what was already theirs in the promised land. They were fighting their enemies. And finally, when they destroyed and God helped them destroy all the enemies... David gets the Ark of the Covenant. He's rejoicing because God has given him the victory over all of his enemies. And he's taking this Ark back and he's celebrating. And in, in, in this whole process, in this whole experience with the family of God, you know, husbands died in their struggle and in their pain and in their, in their, in their fighting. So we had a bunch of widows there. We had children who were fatherless. Uh, a lot of broken folks in that moment. And then God gives them all the victory, and then David writes this psalm as he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in. And the psalm goes something like this. Let them sing. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let them sing their celebration songs for the coming of the cloud rider, whose name is Yahweh. It's the Message Bible. To the fatherless, he's a father. To the widow, he's a champion friend. And to the solitary or the lonely, he gives a family. To the prisoners, those who've been bound, those who've been put in slavery, those who are having a difficult time, he leads them into prosperity until they sing for joy. This is our holy God in his holy place. Amen. Bottom line, freedom. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> for those who feel weak, for those who feel bound this particular holiday this season, I just want you to understand. Those of you who feel powerless, I want you to understand that be expecting God to come and help you recognize who your family is. Amen. All of a sudden, your eyes will be open. It's like, because a lot of times we just, we, we sh we, we're used to a routine. We're used to provision or things happening certain ways. And we don't see the things that God wants us to see and how he, makes, how he wants to make provision abound uh, to our lonely hearts, to our brokenness inside. The most unexpected things can happen. And I want you to expect this year, if you're feeling that way, expect God to give you a God wink. It's like, hey, I see you. I'm going to do something for you this week. Be expecting that. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> when you take a look at the life of Jesus... Jesus said it this way. Let's look at scripture. You know, Jesus in, in Matthew, Matthew's gospel, the 12th chapter, Jesus was speaking to this crowd and his mother and her brothers were outside asking to speak to him. And someone tells Jesus, he goes, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside and they want to speak to you. And Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? And he pointed to the disciples and he says, look, this is my mother. This is my brothers. Anyone who does the will of God of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Amen. We've all heard that passage, right? Whoever's doing the will of God, who's whoever, whoever's doing the will of the father, what is the will of the father? These are individuals that come into your life at the right season of your life, in the right time of your life to do God's will and make God's love known to you. And what is the will of the Father? 
This is one of the ways you can distinguish it. The will of the Father is those individuals that God brings to help you encourage your faith. They help you build you up. They strengthen your faith. They make you aware of who Jesus really is. They put on and they display God's unconditional love for you and always there regardless of what you're facing in life. I love how the Apostle Paul said, I thank God how God sent me in my time of need by the coming of Titus. I thank God when I was in my brokenness and the most hurt as a pastor, I get a phone call from this crazy guy named Joel Maul. I was like, man, this is the craziest thing. And God's been doing that all of my life. Those that are doing the will of the Father that are connected around you are those individuals that remind you of your freedom, that remind you of your purpose, that give you joy and expectation, that remind you of God's love for you, that spur you on to help you and build you up and strengthen you and stir your faith up. Those are the folks that God wants to use and God's placing right there beside you. But a lot of times we don't see it. It's like, oh, there he comes again. (laughs) You go to the grocery store, there they are. You just turn and go the other way. But it's in those moments that God wants to use those folks. I love when our man here at Crossroads, they say, pastor, I got you. I'm like, I know exactly what they mean, especially those guys in the hood. Like they all hear me talking about, you know, one of my daughter's ex-boyfriends that I don't like, and it's like, man, I want to take this guy out. Pastor, I got you. <laughs> Just give me an address. I got you. I'm like, okay, I'll text it to you. No, that's evidence. Let me see here. I'll figure it out. Right? Coming home for Christmas is just a simple message and a reminder of the message of this gospel and how God wants to use you and God wants to use others to minister to you in your loneliness and your brokenness and your weak moments in life. And I know in this room right here, there are a lot of folks that are struggling, a lot of folks who have been hurting and you're spiraling out of control. But the good news is that you're here You still keep coming, keep doing that. But now be more aware of what God wants to do in this hour in your life because he's gonna make you more aware of who your family really is. Jesus left his home to make his home inside of you, right? And those of us who take that seriously are out to express the very character and nature of their father. Because what they was demonstrated to them now, they they have a passion, they have a hunger to go and demonstrate that to others. That's why we go out to Guatemala and do those things. We don't know these people, but it's God's demonstration of unconditional love that they're going to experience. And it's going to be beautiful for them. Speaking of the Christmas story, think about Joseph and Mary. You know, they're pregnant. They wound up going to the census. Augustus is there. And on the journey, you know, you got a pregnant woman on a camel, whatever she was riding. I'm sure that it was hard on the way out there. No biological family around. Mary's pregnant. Joseph, stop hitting those potholes. And Joseph's upset. He's like, man, this ain't even my kid. What's going on? I don't know if he was. I'm just saying. But the opportunity was there, Right. They go, they get neglected. There's no room in the inn. They wound up outside, outcast there in the barn with a bunch of animals and whatever. Nobody's around. But what happens to the lonely? I mean, I'm sure as a husband, I'd be like, man, I want something better for my wife. I want something better for my child. But I can't, I'm I'm limited in supplies. I, I have no control over this. So we'll just make do with what we have, what's been given to us. And there they are. What does God do to the lonely and the broken? It says he he sets the solitary in the family. He brings family to them. And he did the same thing with Mary and Joseph. Who did he bring? Outsider shepherds. These were outsiders. The spirit of God and angels spoke to them and said, hey, the king is here. Come and worship him. Man, I'm sure their heart exploded, confirming and affirming their their obedience to what they were doing, what they were called to do. And then all of a sudden he sends this old man named Simeon and they're going to go and circumcise this child. This man has been waiting all of his life for that one opportunity 
to just bless the Redeemer of Israel and to see him face to face. And the scripture says that Simeon captures and cuddles the Messiah and wraps him in his arm and speaks God's blessing over him. Then he sends this 84-year-old woman to her, Anna, and she rejoices and speaks to them, blesses that child. Why? Because that's what God does in those hard, difficult moments. He brings and makes you become aware of who your family is. Amen? Amen. And my point today is this, that us, you and I, the church, we as a church, we can be the people that God wants to use to minister to those that are lonely. That's why I love this place, man. I feel like I'm coming home every... Natalie asks, where are you going? So I'm going home. It's like, I am at home. Goes, oh, I mean, I'm going to the church. <laughs> it just becomes, it's just one, one, and, one and all. Because this is the place that, that we enjoy. Rick Warren says it this way. He goes, church is not a place that you go to. Church is a family that you belong to. Amen. I love that. So how do I land this plane? Here's your application. Application one, bring, the lo- bring in the lonely this year. Make yourself aware you are in a place where you can reach out to your neighbor. You can reach out and just put on unconditional love. Put that on display to those that are broken and weak. Those that are hurting, those that are struggling. It could be your neighbor. It could be your son or your daughter. It could be even your own spouse who might be grieving over a lost loved one. I don't know. There's nothing wrong to to, to put on God's unconditional love on display towards your spouse. She needs that. You know, there's a study that shows that no woman ever shot her husband while he was doing the dishes. (laughs) I don't even know why I said that. Anyways. So the first thing, be ready to minister to the lonely. Bring the lonely in. I'm not saying invite folks. I don't know. Whatever God's showing you, he will show you who that person is. Why? Because he wants to use you. He wants to use us to demonstrate his love to you people. And the second thing is embrace the family that God set before you. Sometimes we're just so f- moving so fast that we're not aware of the people that God has set right before us. This family right over here, the carpenters, man, I met this guy whenever he was, we were in high school together. Or Manuel's right here. His family's over here. <clears throat> but man, this this is just, they're just beautiful people. I'm so thankful that God sent me these brothers and sisters in Christ who've seen my life since I was a kid. They know all the good, the bad, the ugly. But God has chosen these men and women to become a part of my family. I'll be forever grateful. By the way, I need a loan, brother. No. I think as a pastor... Listen, this is just pastoralish. I think people leave churches too soon. They just go church hopping here, church hopping there. They make haste decisions. The very thing that God wants to use to bring healing and restoration and strength to a family, they don't recognize it. Therefore, they abort that transformation process prematurely. And they'll never transformation will be delayed over and over and over again because they fail to recognize the beauty of what's right there before them. Let me close with this. One Christmas, a family was in a serious traffic accident. The youngest son, uh, Mike, was seriously injured and he needed blood. His brother, Danny, he's only eight years old. He happened to have the same blood type. And Danny's dad explained to him carefully how it would be really, really good if little, uh, if he could give some of that blood to his brother so he could help him out. He goes, do you mind doing that? So little Danny thought about it for a little bit. He says, yes, Daddy, I'll give my blood so Mike can get better. And so <clears throat> they put a needle in little Danny's vein. They began to draw the blood out. And once the needle was backed out, Danny looked up at his dad with tears running down from his eyes. He goes, Daddy, when am I going to die? It was only then that his dad realized that Danny didn't know that he was just giving him some blood. He thought he was actually giving his life away. 
Danny went all in. And that's my prayer for us to go all in this year. To go all in and be, be the message of hope to those that are broken and lonely. And receive the message of God's love to the people that are right here next to you that we've not been aware of. Amen? Why? Because God sets the solitary in family. Father, we are so thankful for your goodness and for your love and how you've demonstrated this in our lives. And Master, we just ask that you just uh, help us to honor that and to pay this forward to this city, to this community, to ourselves, Lord. To step out in faith, not be shy, not be just afraid or timid of being that person, being that family. So we just commit this to you. Thank you that our eyes are open, that you make um, opportunities available to us this week to do that. In Jesus' name, and everyone that agreed with that said, amen. amen. Love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday. Be praying for those in Guatemala. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>